Good morning and afternoon, everyone. My name is Aaron Gorell, and thank you for participating in today's 386th webinar, Is Your Body Armor Helpful or Harmful? Five Myths About Body Armor Are Busted by the Experts. Now, our webinar today is sponsored by U.S.-based ShotStop Ballistics. ShotStop is developing the lightest, thinnest, and strongest advanced armor technologies in the world. And with technical expertise that spans more than 35 years, the ShotStop team creates ballistic technology that saves lives, reduces physical encumbrance, and maximizes performance. ShotStop consistently uses independent and federally accredited ballistic labs, including the Department of Defense and National Institute of Justice, to ensure its armor provides our first responders with the best possible protection. Now, during this webinar, an experienced panel of law enforcement and military experts will discuss today's body armor options, how they differ from the past, and what you need to know about the armor that's supposed to protect the lives of you and your personnel. What you think you know about body armor could be putting you and your team at risk, and our presenters will discuss the five myths of body armor and reveal many other truths. Now, our presenters for today include Sheriff Steve Lauderchek, from Ottawa County, Ohio, Sheriff A.J. Lauterbach from Jackson County, Texas, Colonel Sam Johnson, Jason Henkel, and Skip Karvorsky, all from ShotStop. Sher Sheriff Lavorchek Lauter <laughs> has over 35 years of law enforcement experience with 32 of those years at the Ottawa County Sheriff's Office. He has served in many capabilities within capacities within the Sheriff's Office, including patrol, detective, SWAT operator, SWAT commander, and supervision. In September 2011, the sheriff took over as sheriff of Ottawa County, where he currently resides. Sheriff A.J. Lauterbach is a fifth-generation Texan and a 40-year law enforcement professional serving his fourth term as the Jackson County Sheriff. Apart from his service in the Air Force, Lauterbach has spent his entire career serving the people of Edna and Jackson County, Texas. He represents the National Sheriff's Association as a member of the National Institute of Justice's Special Technical Committee on Law Enforcement Firearms and is actively involved in the Sheriff's Association of Texas. Colonel Sam Johnson, retired, is an advisor to the Shot Stop team. He's a West Point graduate and his 30-year career included brigade commander in Panama, Bosnia, Afghanistan, and Iraq, as well as director of strategic communications in Afghanistan. Sam has capitalized on his unique military and leadership experiences to build multiple successful organizations, including his current role as managing partner at Climb to Glory. And last but certainly not least are our presenters from Shot Stop, Jason Henkel, who is the Director of Business Operations, and Skip Kavorsky, who is Director of Business Development. Now, before we begin, I'd like to address some basic housekeeping items. First, this event is being recorded and it's scheduled to last about 60 minutes and will be available to subscribers on the Justice Clearinghouse website. Second, this is a listen only event, but you can type in any questions you have through the GoToWebinar toolbar, and we'll take as many of those questions as possible at the end of the formal presentation. Next, if you experience any audio issues such as the sound cutting in and out intermittently, consider dialing in using the phone number included in your emailed invite. And when the system asks for a PIN, you can bypass that by hitting the pound key. We have incorporated several polling questions into this webinar, and just by way of a trial run, I'd actually like to ask that first question, which is what time zone are you in? Are you Eastern time, Central time, or Mountain time, Pacific time, or maybe you're not in the mainland United States and you need to select other? And we'll give folks just about another 10 seconds to respond to this. And I really appreciate everyone taking the time to respond. It really does help us understand the best timing for all of our programs here at the Clearinghouse. And I'll go ahead and close the poll and share the results. 65% of you are from the East Coast with 20% from Central Time Zone, 3% are Mountain Time, 9% are Pacific, and 3% of you look like you're outside of the continental United States. Well, thank you again very much for participating in that poll. I do want to let you know that our presenters have shared a number of handouts. You can download those from the GoToWebinar toolbar under the handouts menu item. There's four of them. And then finally, after today's webinar, there will be a follow-up survey and we ask that you ask that you complete it. 
Your feedback helps us shape pretty much everything we do here at the Clearinghouse. And with that, I'll go ahead and turn the presentation over to our instructors for today. Jason, it's all yours. Thank you, Aaron. I appreciate that introduction. Hello, everybody. Uh, we appreciate your time. And first and foremost, would like to thank you on the line. This is a very uh, special audience to our mission here at Shot Stop Ballistics, which is to help save the lives of those who serve. We thank you for your service and helping make your communities safe and civilized. We'd like to uh, start this conversation today uh, with a couple of the, the, you know, there are a lot of, let's call it uh, aggressive marketing uh, campaigns and efforts in the body armor industry. And for those of you who do serve and wear body armor and are standing in the way of bullets protecting the community, it can be a daunting task when it comes time to buy body armor, whether you're talking about soft body armor to stop handguns or the more up and coming uh, rifle protection question. Um, by the time you're done with a couple Google searches, you're usually more confused than you were when you did your first Google search. And today's presentation is really to zip through several slides. A lot of FBI data will be shown, kind of compiled in a way that's digestible, but we, we want to be the, uh, the, the cornerstone of educating um, audiences who are interested in body armor procurement based on data, not on twisty marketing and kind of convoluted data. So we want to um, walk through this. Our, our panel experts that you just heard about will be um, uh, you know, tapping in from time to time as we go through these slides. But in the end, we hope that you, you turn off this presentation, download the uh, handouts that we have, and have a much better understanding of actually what's out there and what is actually relevant. Um, because if you get the wrong body armor, it can literally be harmful as opposed to helpful. And so we're gonna address some of the primary myths and a couple other myths beyond that throughout this presentation. So before we do that, oh, looks like I may have lost, there we are. I'd like to start with one poll question, Aaron, if you could please ask the group, on a scale of one to 10, and your name is not associated with this answer, so no, it's totally anonymous, how knowledgeable do you consider yourself on the subject of body armor? Two answers possible. One being, I just wear the stuff, or I'm sorry, it's actually one through 10 scale. A 10 being, I am probably more knowledgeable than anyone in any law enforcement room. Just, just to get an idea of the audience and and how well versed we all are, because we know we know it it does vary out there in the field. Great, Jason. Uh, the polling question is up and running. Uh, we did reduce it to a scale from one to five. We only are able to uh, show up to five options, but the options are basically the same. One being I just wear the stuff. Five being I know more than anyone else in most law enforcement rooms, and then the, all those options in between two through four. And we'll give folks just about another five seconds to respond. Thanks so much for sharing this information, everyone. And I'm going to go ahead and close the poll. Share the results. All right, so 29% of our audience has indicated that they just wear the stuff. 26 indicate 26 percent indicate they're kind of in that second category of understanding. 31% indicated they're in the middle of the road, number three. 11% indicate four. And 4% 4 say that they know more than anyone else in most law enforcement rooms. And I'll hand it back to you, Jason. Okay, that's excellent. Thank you very much for that input. Um, that, that does help us to kind of gear some of the, the words that we use here in the coming slides, which we're gonna be digging into uh, data and statistics and information that we find on a lot of publicly available uh, databases in terms of law enforcement uh, deaths on duty, um, law enforcement uh, killed in the line of duty databases and other sources. And it's, what it's gonna do is set the platform for considerations of those who are curious to get to the real answers, the real essence of the questions that you need to be asking uh, when considering body armor. We're just gonna go through these next three, few slides uh, relatively quickly. Just wanna kind of, again, setting the platform here, any panelists, as you see any, uh, any information you'd like to chime in on from your own experience that might be uh, near and dear to your heart, feel free to step in as ready. A little bit of information here. In the year 2018, uh, 49 officers were killed with firearms. 
in the line of duty. And uh, when you look at what was the actual weapon used, obviously leading the pack is handguns with 33. Uh, behind, closely behind that is rifles with nine instances, two shotguns, and five not reported for various reasons. Um, you can pretty much assume that one or two of those will go up into handguns and rifles. And so you're looking you know, at, at, a, at roughly 25% rifles, 75% handguns, and then you do get the the off shotgun situation. So uh, objectively speaking, when, if this is one year, that's how many officers were killed with handguns and rifles and shotguns. Um, are our officers underprotected? Should the conversation around more armor or higher levels of protection armor be uh, in consideration? The answer is absolutely. Uh, it shot stop. We're, we're going for zero. We know that's not possible. Uh, 50 is far too high for those who serve, and we do hope that uh, we do see an upward trend in the conversations uh, at the uh, offices, departments, and agencies, uh, but we, we do think that it should be uh, even further considered in the cities, departments, agencies, and offices, and we would like to present as much data to as many of those who are in consideration and have decision power to, to know some of these, these, this information. And as we go through all of these slides, you will receive a copy of this slide deck and the sources are actually below each statistic. So you can feel free to look that up if you do have an internal conversation at your office department or agency to have where you need supporting data. We actually just wanna give you the tools to have an objective conversation to those who do make decisions. Jason, this, this slide back. Yes, Sheriff. I'd like to make a comment too, and, and going back one slide on on the scale from one to ten on where, uh, in, in here in Texas, uh, which I'm familiar with more than across the nation, but we have a large geographical area, and I, I find that most uh, patrol officers are uh, are protected, um, and and the knowledge level being somewhere around uh, probably a, a, a three to four on the scale from one to ten. Out there, so I, I have uh, a few, obviously a smaller percentage that would see. Uh, I just wear the stuff, and but very few who know um, who know the most of any person in the LA room. So I, I think the true balance is there somewhere around that three or four mark here in Texas. But the the geography. I live on the Gulf Coast here, where it's muggy and hot, and we have extreme temperature uh, issues from high heat to uh, to a lot of water. So. Um, in the underprotected section on our LE servicemen and women underprotected, uh, our patrol services um, are, are, are overall wearing uh, external body armor religiously. I, I do uh, see a need for a better fit with, with more side coverage and maybe a little bit deeper coverage uh, covering uh, a little bit more of the abdomen area down in the pelvic area a little bit more. But um, these are some areas, and, and the one area that is, is, is evident here in this state is uh, investigators and other folks who, in, especially in the rural areas, who may be pressed into emergency service very quickly, uh, not having uh, adequate armor uh, uh, to, to go into a situation on, on a moment's notice. So that's, those are just some things from a Texas perspective that uh, could be addressed by the manufacturers. Very good. Well noted, well noted. And it is good to hear that the, the knowledge level is quite high uh, from the, the hundred thousands of agencies we are in conversation with. Uh, we would say, uh, you know, they're, they're probably closer to the two to three average. So it sounds like from our subjective and not statistical opinion, you guys are a bit more uh, well informed on the options and uh, a little bit more well thought through. Uh, so. We have taken note of that extra protection need, and uh, that is not the first time we've heard that. It's uh, definitely uh, something that is in the works, both from a new technology standpoint uh, to address the heat and the uncomfort, but also the, the protection coverage. And we're going to get into that a little bit more on, uh, on some future slides here. So thank you for that input. Okay. <clears throat> a quick glance here. Uh, the question are, are you know, is it getting more dangerous out there uh, from a firearm standpoint? Uh, officers killed in, in the line of duty from 2017 to 2018, there has actually been a 23% increase in, in uh, law enforcement uh, deaths by firearms. 
So it, it going to the same thing, it, you know, it is a, a hot topic. It is a very dangerous world for those who serve right now and becoming more dangerous. And there are some reasons for that. Um, and we're going to get into some of the, the slides here coming right up that uh, explain this just a bit. Firearms related uh, or and, and crimes related to firearms, as you look at this, this slide here, um, let's put it this way. Bad guys are doing similar bad things, but with gun in hand more often is what this slide is about. So the dark blue of each of those crime categories represents uh, 2013 snapshots, and then the light blue of each of those crime categories is 2016. You see significant increases in those crime categories where people are using firearms in those activities. So it, it truly is uh, a, a dangerous situation, getting a little bit more dangerous by the year. So if the, the conversation in the department agency or office is, do we really need to up our armor uh, from the past? The answer is objectively speaking, absolutely. This slide is just a snapshot. I'm not going to be spending much time on it, but you could take a look at it after the presentation. It just kind of humanizes all of this data about law enforcement officers' death on duty. Uh, the administrators, uh, very caring people, have a very challenging job of people having to set budgets and decide where the money is spent. Um, so, you know, it's a fine line. There are budgets. There is only so much money, but these are human beings. And these are, this is just a, a quick dashboard showing, you know, the, the law enforcement officers' uh, deaths from the average age, uh, you know, a middle aged person in the middle of their life, age 41, is the average death on duty, the youngest being 23 recorded in this 10 year period, the oldest being 76. Most of these are male versus female, if you look on the, the pie graph to the left. To the far right, you'll see how long did they serve on average. And the average length of service is 12 years uh, for those uh, deaths on duties and so on and so forth. So it's putting a little bit of, of humanization to the data. Um, you know, that hopefully as agencies are looking at body armor, they are considering historical threats to officers in their regions and their city and nationally. They're, you know, the FBI data is robust and you can definitely see what bullets are being shot at and uh, impacting law enforcement officers. So here's just a little bit more data for you to consider as you uh, are, are working through the body armor procurement in your department agency or office. Going back to the, the uh, conversation about a little bit more protection as Sheriff Lauterbach just mentioned. So in 2018 of those deaths recorded on that first slide, the 49 deaths, we have the strike locations here. So the front of head was something we're not going to be able to change here as, a, as an armor manufacturer at this time. Uh, however, the in second place is front upper torso or chest. This is a very preventable death when properly armored. We had seven of those. Neck and throat, you get into the upper throat, body armor does start getting into that area. Side of head, we're not going to be able to help. There were five of those. Rear of head, not going to be able to help, three of those. Uh, one front legs and feet, one front lower torso abdomen, which could be worked on with body armor. And then eight not reported. So again, you could probably put the not reported up into the top two or three. So if you kind of just look at this, that whole 14% of deaths were caused by preventable areas of strike. And so if I'm a law enforcement officer, and I don't need to be telling anyone on this line this, but I will take a 14% increase in odds if I'm in an active threat strike situation anytime. So it is very important that you are properly protected in these preventable areas. It's just an odds game, uh, but it's, again, more data backing that um, protection that's preventable should absolutely be taken. 14% increase in odds. That's a big number when you're talking about life and death. Here's another piece of data that is very striking. Um, one of the big things we hear about is I got the, for instance, especially rifle plates. I got the rifle plates the agency or office, you know, uh, gave to us, but the stuff weighs 25 pounds. 
and there's no way I'm going to be wearing that. It'll, it'll impede my mission. We hear that a lot. So it sits in the front seat right next to them. And statistically, if you're in an active threat situation, the odds of uh, death are actually 14 times more likely than those uh, who do actually consistently wear their armor. So this is something that just should never be ignored for anyone who would ever face an active threat situation. Um, if you have body armor, definitely got to be wearing it um, just by statistics alone. Um, really, no, no yeah. opinion hey, here. Jason. That's, that's yes, sir. Yeah, Jason, this is this is Colonel Sam Johnson, retired. Hey, I, I just wanted to reinforce something on, on this slide that we also saw in numerous places overseas. When you when you get issued bulky and weight uh, heavy body armor, we we would have commanders that that would take calculated risk and selectively wear their body armor based on what they perceive to be the threat. And I, and I know policemen, police officers uh, deal with this all the time. Um, perceived threat isn't always the real threat. And um, and I know we put soldiers in danger just because of the bulk and weight of the body armor that we were wearing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no question. Thank you. Thank you, Colonel. I want to turn to uh, another statistic that is alarming. Um, if it were more controlled, perhaps not as alarming, but currently 4 million new handguns enter the U.S. market every year. This does not include imports. That's, those are handguns produced here. And that does not include black market transactions. The number of handguns is, is increasing a lot. So it, again, it goes to that when criminal activity is happening, what are the odds that there is a gun involved? Just by sheer numbers, of guns pouring into the market into civilian hands, the odds are going up, objectively speaking. So this, this needs to be known by those making decisions. <clears throat> That's handguns. Looking at rifles, there are currently 3.7 million rifles produced in the United States alone. This does not include imports and black market activity either. So um, soft armor, handgun protection, I, I'd say it's pretty well covered in the United States law enforcement world. Uh, the, the big conversation is more and more into rifles. We're seeing a lot, you know, there's a lot of activity with rifles, more and more happening. And we have a, a slide coming up here that shows uh, a shameful uh, statistic of underprotected death from soft armor where rifles uh, did pass through and killed the officer. Um, if this conversation is going on in your department, office, or agency, we encourage you to inform how many rifles are pouring into the United States every year. It's, it's an alarming rate, and we will see more criminal activity just by sheer numbers of rifles that are pouring in. So that's, that's something that please keep in mind. And with the increased number of rifles coming into civilian hands, it's probably a good idea to take a look at one of our specialties here at Shot Stop is rifle protection uh, with the, uh, the, the active threat carrier kits and plates and whatnot. There are three primary technologies to stop rifle rounds uh, for rifle plates for body armor, let's be specific. The first option to look at to consider is steel or metal any kind of metal or steel. The, this is the, the heaviest option, but you still see it on occasion because it's so inexpensive. Um, it's attractive to the administrator. Any operator on the field absolutely hates this stuff for many reasons. It's heavy. It has a very uh, nasty ricochet. Um, so your, you know, your, your teammates are not in the same, in, you know, in the, in the clear if your uh, rifle plate that is sealed catches a round. <clears throat> um, we are seeing people moving away from that as a trend uh, with the newer technologies coming in. Uh, thankfully, steel is not uh, as popular as it used to be. The next technology to look at for stopping rifle rounds with body armor would be your ceramic plate. Uh, many options of ceramic composites. But uh, ceramics are considered because they are quite a bit lighter in general than steel, although some get up into the steel and metal weight. Um, this is also uh, 
uh, when you look at the thickness of ceramic plates versus steel plates, ceramic plates are going to be a little thicker. So now you're talking about some mobility issues. You're talking about it being more bulky, less comfortable. It is also a very, uh, by nature, fragile material. So you have to be careful. Any active threat situation, if you had to jump a fence, if you accidentally may have dinged it with a tire iron in the trunk or uh, any other accidental drops, um, ceramic should be x-rayed because hairline fractures can cause bullets to go through them. Um, the other part about ceramics is they are the midway on the price point. They are more expensive than steel plates, um, but they're not ex as expensive as the next technology we'll talk about, which is the polyethylene plate, which are the lightest category. So we'll move on to polyethylene now. So we've got steel, very heavy, very inexpensive. We've got ceramic plates, which are uh, less uh, heavy, a little bit more expensive, but fragile. And then you have polyethylene, which is the third category of technologies for stopping rifle rounds for body armor. And this one's actually the lightest option. It's, it's significantly lighter than steel or ceramic. Tri typically, they are more expensive. It's a newer technology. Within 10 years, they've been coming online to the point now where you do see them at most trade shows and they are available. Uh, they do have a very good multi-hit capability. As in, uh, one, one problem with ceramics is if you, if you do encounter a strike, usually within two to three inches of that strike all the way around the diameter, uh, you wouldn't want to be hit with a second bullet. If a, a perp were, had a bump stock or a fully automatic, it could be a very dangerous situation where polyethylene plates can take multiple rounds in, in very close proximity to each other. Uh, so as far as which option you would want, which option would the operator feel most comfortable in, they're usually going to pick the polyethylene because it is the thinnest, it, uh, I'm sorry, the lightest. And in, in some cases with, as an example, our deridium uh, polyethylene mm -hmm. plates, they are also the thinnest on the market at those threat levels. Um, but traditionally, it's been expensive. Um, Shotstop has addressed that with long warranty and a very highly competitive upfront cost. Uh, so we're, we're now finally bringing the cost of this newer technology, the polyethylene rifle plates, uh, to an affordable and more realistic realm where law enforcement can finally truly afford it. In fact, if you look at the cost of ownership, which we're going to here in a minute, it is a lower cost option. So the, the last little hey, Jason. point for you. Yes, sir. This is Skip. Um, I want to ask a question to both Sheriff Laborczyk and Sheriff Lauterbach. Um, let's take this a step farther on the plates, talking about steel and ceramic. Have either one of you gentlemen had any workers' comp claims come in from one of your deputies wearing plates like that? And I ask you this because I was with an agency, and a, a detective actually told me he caused himself a concussion by putting on his body armor going to a call. So I wanted to ask that question to both you, Sheriff, if that ever happened to you on workers' comp claims, and if that comes into play when you're looking at body armor. This is Steve Lavorchuk, and I'll tell you that uh, I have not had a, a BWC claim due to uh, the wearing of the body armor. Um, but I guess I wanted to throw out there, this brings up such a great point, and, and numerous points have been made already that you have to consider when you purchase body armor and when you're going to invest in the safety of, of your people. And uh, the weight and the wearability is incredible. You can spend the largest amount or the smallest amount of money on body armor, but if your people aren't going to wear it, it's worthless. So um, I was 20 years on SWAT, 10 years as SWAT commander. And I've worn the ceramic plates. Um, I've worn the steel plates. And um, I'll tell you, the longest time I had them on was 59 hours straight after 9-11 at our nuclear uh, power station here in the county. And worked 59 hours straight at the front gate. And uh, we had ceramic plates. And I'll tell you, after I went home, I, I felt like I couldn't move for like three days because of carrying that weight for so long. And uh, with our, our new... Uh, uh, shot stop plates that, that I purchased and put in every one of my cars, my guys love them. And my, my SRT guys, my SWAT guys, um, they got the level fours with the side panel protection. 
they absolutely they, they can't believe how comfortable they are let me uh, let me also add uh, clearly here here in Texas that uh, steel is simply going to be in a locker in the in the trunk of a patrol car or in Texas here in the back of a truck stuck somewhere with a lot of dust on it so uh, weight and, and and lightness are the key uh, as Sheriff Leporchik, uh aptly put it but um you know the, the anything that's lighter more pliable um has some flexibility to it feels more natural is is the way we go and that's that's the direction that the industry um led by shot stop is going to have to go uh to increase the effectiveness and increase the wearability of this of this plate has always been the goal so yeah yep excellent thank you for that as well. yep. Hey, it's Kip Sam Johnson. I, just, I can yeah. say one more thing. Um, I was yesterday. We uh, this week we're having the Ohio Tactical Officers Association conference at uh, Kalahari in Sandusky, Ohio, and I was over there yesterday for the vendor day. We have over 1,500 participants, and it's the largest tactical conference in in the United States. And we had 600 vendors, and other, obviously all these SWAT cops. Most of the booths they stop at are the rifles. They want to stop and see all the sexy toys and all that. But uh, the second most uh, visited booths that I saw watch, watching the officers there were the body armor booths where, where they were comparing the, the feel of those plates and, you know, getting information on their, their, uh, their quality, the stoppability, um, you know, how well they're made. But every single one of them picks it, pick up a plate, and they'll say, "Man, that that thing's heavy." Or you'll see them say, "Man, I could wear this all day." So I mean, that the wearability is where it really comes from in law enforcement, because uh, as Sheriff Lauterbach can tell you too, being in it for many years, personal body armor, we've come a long way, and we're now starting to make those big steps forward, I believe, in uh, plates and carriers. Yeah, guys, this is Sam Johnson. I, just one other thing. Wearability, certainly, Steve, is important. I would also tell you from experience that that uh, the reliability of ceramic is a little bit questionable. We had a, a soldier stitched at close range with three AK-47 rounds in Afghanistan, and the plate stopped the first two, and the plate began to crumble, and the third round uh, pierced pierced the plate. Fortunately, survived, but uh, I know I don't want that kind of protection on uh, my soldiers, and I'm sure sure that police officers don't want that kind of protection on their their uh, officers as well. Yeah. Very good. Well, thank you for all that input. Thank you for the question, Skip. Um, last last note on this slide: if you would like to look deeper into this question of which technology is the best for your particular need. Uh, there's a link right there in the slide. When you get this deck, you can click into that. It'll help to better prepare you for your conversations uh, internally. Uh, another question here, Aaron, if we could do a quick poll. Uh, of, the, of all the callers on the line, uh, what kind of rifle protection plates are you in possession of currently? So one through five, ceramic, steel, polyethylene, I do not know, or I don't have rifle protection. Perfect. That poll is open. We'll give folks about another 10, 15 seconds to respond. And again, please indicate the kind of rifle protection plates that you're in possession of. Thank you all so much for voting. We'll close it down in about five seconds here. Wow, I'm a little shocked at these results. I've got to admit, um, I'm going to go ahead and close down the poll. 40% uh, of the audience indicate that they don't have rifle protection. Now, maybe that's because they're not in law enforcement or something along those lines, but uh, but that's that's uh, that's a big number. 17, uh, so then tight at 18% is polyethylene, and I don't know. 17% indicate steel, and only 7% indicated ceramic. And back to you. Excellent. Well, that's very interesting. Yeah, good insight. And we do have some mixed audience. I know we have some uh, um, education on the line and, and some of the some of, uh, office workers as well. So anyway, that is very insightful. Appreciate you taking time to look at that. And let us know on that. Um, I want to get into the polyethylene myth number one. As I mentioned, it is the newer technology on the block. It is by far lighter and far more uh, protective in terms of multi-hit capabilities. 
uh, in Deridium, Shot Stop's Deridium case, it is the uh, actually the thinner option as well at same protection levels. Um, but it is worth noting that if you do hear out there that polyethylene plates, which seem impossibly light if you've never held one compared to ceramic or steel, actually have amazing stopping power. We have many, many, many uh, Examples here, both formal third-party ballistic lab tested in IDA accredited laboratories. We have uh, informal tests internal. We have informal tests external. Uh, we encourage you to uh, do some Google searches on uh, shot stop stopping power polyethylene plates, and you'll see some pretty obnoxiously abused rifle plates with no penetration. Uh, but yeah, uh, we are here to tell you that polyethylene plates, just because they are so unbelievably lighter, you lose no ballistics protection integrity. In fact, you gain it. And so we wanted to just put that myth to bed. Absolutely, it's time to evolve out of the fragile ceramics and the prohibitively heavy steel options on the market. It's absolutely time. Myth number two, uh, law enforcement needs level four body armor. Uh, Sheriff Lavorchik has a very different situation. He is guard of a nuclear facility, and, and Sheriff, is that a required uh, protection level for that situation, correct? No, not for, for our people, but for the, uh, uh, and I really can't talk about what the nuclear power facility's private security uh, mm. is required to wear and what's, what's required through the federal government. Um, but my office is the first responding tactical team should the need arise within that facility. And uh, uh, with not only that, but also on any of our SWAT callouts, I, I wanna make sure my guys are best protected they can possibly be. And uh, we always had level three, but now that with the weight and the wearability of shot stop, we went to level four. And, it, and mm -hmm. it's still much lighter than the level three ceramics and level three steels were. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. What, what we'll show here is for those uh, law enforcement officers who are considering level three or level four, it is uh, it is absolutely an internal decision. Uh, Sheriff Lavorchik, as you just heard, him and his guys went with level four. Uh, you do take on more weight for, for that higher level protection. Uh, according to FBI data, um, there has never been a, a law enforcement officer struck or attempted strike at from a tungsten carbide tipped round or an armor piercing round. Um, you know, the heavy hits are the AR-15 platforms and the AK-47 platforms. And on occasion, you get the farmer with the 308 rounds uh, volleyed at you. But uh, by and large, it's AK-47, AR-15, non-armor piercing. So it is, a, it is a significant poundage increase to go to that level four armor piercing protection. But as the sheriff just said, he wants anything that can come out of a barrel to be stopped. And so there's definitely logic behind that. Um, if your tactical officers are uh, calling out, we'd rather have mobility and you know a lower profile, well, then certainly you don't need to take on that extra weight and extra thickness to get the level four, which statistically hasn't happened yet, but there will always be a first. So I wanted to just bring light to the subject of level four versus level three. It is a deliberate decision. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Jason, this is Skip. Uh, I, I'd like to uh, make two comments here. The first comment is whatever body armor company anybody talks to, the first question out of their mouth should be, what threat level do you come in contact with? Because we do not understand what you do on every day and what you come across. And what I mean by that, if I'm around in military um, bases, the rounds are gonna be different than if I'm in Texas. If I'm close to water, I might have different needs than I would if I'm sitting next to a nuclear plant. So do please do not allow a body armor company, whoever they are, tell you what you need. This is something that's critical that I see. And the second thing is a level four plate, and this is just a theory. And Sheriff and Colonel, uh, Sheriff Lavorchik and Sheriff Lauterbach, please uh, help me out on this one and give me your input and Colonel Johnson. But my theory on a level four 
ceramic plate is this. Please take a ceramic mug. Find the heaviest ceramic mug you can find and drop it and tell me what happens. But the reason I believe that a lot of people buy level four ceramic is so they can stop maybe a five, five, six round, maybe stop three or four, or a seven, six, two by three, nine, or a 308 round. So I think they get the thicker ceramics, so they might stop those because they don't have to worry about the hairline fracture before it turns to dust. That's just a theory, but that's something that I've been coming across for the past couple of years. What do you, what do you gentlemen think about that? Let's get Sam Johnson here. I, I would just tell you this: um, after a, a year deployment to dangerous places and wearing ceramic gear uh, we of course would always have to turn in all of our plates for inspection when we get back and we routinely would only get back 80 percent of the plates we turned in anywhere from 75 to 80 percent in other words the others were taken out of inventory because they had hairline cracks <laughs> so my, my bigger issue with ceramics is that um, I just can't trust the reliability of them. You don't know when a soldier or a police officer drops it. You don't know when that hairline crack might appear. And then once it's there, you're dealing with an ineffective plate. Yes. All right. Well, very good. Uh, yeah, thank you for that contribution. Looking one one more polyethylene myth, uh, polyethylene is more expensive than ceramic. So we're going to go into how long polyethylene is uh, good in active duty. How long are the warranties? Very important. Uh, as you just heard a couple comments there, ceramics are fragile. They are the incumbent technology. Most uh, law enforcement do have that. Our poll didn't really show that today, which was interesting. But um, m most plates in the market in hands of law enforcement or, or warfighter are actually ceramic. Um, and it, they typically have five-year life cycles. And the reasons are very obvious. In fact, to, to honor the five-year warranty, if you read the fine print, they usually have to do an MRI or an X-ray at the 2.5-year mark and have it documented before the warranty is, uh, is uh, honored. So you kind of have to be really careful with ceramics around that. Polyethylene is not so much the case, which is why at Shot Stop, our, our polyethylene plates all have 15-year warranties without x-rays or MRIs required to honor that warranty. So if you look at the whole life cost of a ceramic plate versus a polyethylene plate, We'll take a glance. You know, this is kind of an eye chart. I'll just walk you through it verbally real fast. If an agency with 20 officers uh, buy ceramic plates every five years, so you see the three five-year periods um, of buying ceramic plates, that's $10,000 per procurement for that 20-person agency, front and back ceramic plates at $250 per plate, which is a very good price on plates if you're able to get it that low. You're dealing with a 15-year procurement of $30,000. So you're buying plates every five years for ceramic option. The newer uh, duradium polyethylene plates, it's a 15-year warranty. You have one procurement over the three five-year period because you only have to buy it once instead of every five years. So you're looking at about a, uh, a $12,000 out-of-pocket versus a $30,000 out-of-pocket plus no maintenance required. So it's, it's obviously a benefit long-term and upfront, you know, the, you, we have many options of uh, plates if polyethylene is what you're looking for. Um, and it is strongly encouraged that when you consider plates, get all of the options on the table, make a, make a matrix of questions and answer for each of the competitive plates you're looking at. And to help with that, you'll see one of the handouts that you have is a 17-question buyer's guide that you should ask every single body armor maker that you're considering. If they balk on any of these questions, then you should probably put the yellow flag up. So we highly encourage you to download that buyer's guide 
and utilize it as you analyze all of your uh, body armor options, including us. Shots up, like ask us those questions as well. Okay, myth number four, soft armor vests provide the necessary protection. Uh, well, it does provide protection. It has certainly saved a lot of law enforcement, uh, you know, peacemaker lives out there, let's say. Uh, more than 3,000 police officers have been saved because of body armor at, by, at, at large. Between 2017 and 2016, 137 officers were killed with guns while wearing body armor. Here's the big data. 24 of those uh, deaths were related to the vest being penetrated. So the threat level was too high for it. In other words, rifle protection or rifle hitting soft armor rounds or soft armor. So if you consider that, it, again, this is a numbers game, just like the other slides you saw before. Anytime an armor company sees a, a stat like that, um, we certainly think we have our work cut out for us to make that number zero. It'll never happen, but uh, armor, preventable soft armor, which was penetrated by rifle rounds, is more and more prevalent. And we hope that the offices, agencies, and departments will strongly consider that. And you saw how many new rifles are, are going into civilian hands. The encounters with these are going to only increase, and we would hate to see this number go up when the data is crystal clear. Uh, a good starting place to uh, look at what threats should this department or my agency or my office be looking for, the National Institute of Justice is a very good starting place for you. Um, the current standard, uh, the 010.06 NI National Institute of Justice standard, kind of outlines, uh, you'll see the armor type on the left-hand side there, 12A, 2, 3A, 3, and 4. It's all listed uh, very simply, which ammunition uh, those levels are uh, supposed to stop. So that should be, a, you know, the very first question is, okay, which of these levels do we need? And then once you have that, it goes into a whole other question of, you know, what you read on the internet, how much of it is true. And here's where you got to be very careful. Uh, you got to find a trustworthy source. You have to find knowledgeable people. And I have to say, out of personal experience, I'm shocked at how confidently some of the uh, industry experts, quote unquote, will say things that are simply, objectively speaking, not correct. So you do have to be very careful with the information you're gathering, who's giving it to you, and are they just trying to sound smart or do they truly know the data? and they pull the report from the third-party labs and give you the real information. <clears throat> and Jason, that, and this, Jason this, this is Skip. Yeah. One thing on that, too, uh, please, when you look at the NIJ reports, and I, I came across this, so if we have any fire on the line, this is especially important. Um, look at what standard it is. The current NIJ standard is 010106. We're about ready to go to a new standard. But I was with a fire department, and they bought these plates, and uh, the company that sold it to them said they were doing such a great job, and they're giving them this great plate. Well, the standard was from 2005. So they had plates that were from an NIJ standard from 2005, and they were sold to them last year. So now they're stuck with those plates for another four years. So you're looking at almost 20 years difference from when they were tested to when they're going to be expired. So really look at that too. Yeah. Great, great point, Skip. Yep. And I'm sure, you know, some on the line are aware the National Institute of Justice is about to drop their newest standards, which will be 010.07. Uh, all the manufacturers are, are eager to get the new permissions to go and get their armor tested to the new standard. They will be adding green tip threat to that, which is, was kind of one of the big hot points that was missing in this older standard that's about to go outdated. But as Skip said, we've seen so many companies touting that their body armor is so light, but it's tested to a standard one or two cycles ago. And it, it's just snake oil. And we can't believe the companies do it, but it is real. It, it happens out there. So if you find a super light plate that looks thinner than everyone's and the price is lower, uh, there's there's usually a reason. 
you just got to look into it. All Jason, right, just skip to, here. Yeah. Yeah, skip. Sorry, one more comment. This is Skip. Two other things, um, and, and I, I say this, we use it, but when you see a plus, so you see three plus, my question to you is what does that plus mean to you? Does that mean multi-hit or does that mean special threat? That is very important because the NIJ does not have a plus. So if it's plus meaning multi-hit, that's one thing. So it's a marketing tool that the body armor industry uses, but just understand what does plus mean to you, special threat or multi-hit? And the last thing, there are some companies out there, like Jason said, with the snake oil sales, there are a couple of companies out there now saying we're at, we're testing to the 010107 standard, new standards that haven't been released yet. So my question is, how do you test to a standard that's not yet released? Back to you, Jay. That's, that's interesting. Yeah, we just recently saw that. We know for a fact you can't test that standard yet. Uh, it hasn't been formally released. Um, okay, so we do want to dig a little bit more into this NIJ uh, conversation. It is something, it, it's very important to, to get involved and understand that. And on this slide, you will see, uh, for after you download this presentation deck, you can actually download the whole standard. You can read about it. And if you're in charge of procurement or on that procurement team for body armor, highly recommend it. It's very informative and it'll make it a lot harder for the, the uh, aggressive marketers to manipulate you one way or the other once you have that kind of knowledge. Um, keep in mind too, that just because you see an NIJ stamp on a plate or on a website, that uh, we found on many occasions not to be true. When we actually looked at the NIJ uh, compliance list on the NIJ website, the, the products and the companies who had those logos weren't even listed on that. So it's, it's just straight lying in some cases. So check it yourself. In this deck, you will find the link to the, the actual National Institute of Justice's uh, compliance product list where you can check for yourself. Um, so again, anyone can claim, quote unquote, that they, they meet the NIJ requirements, but do they actually, are they actually listed on the NIJ website? Very important to see it with your own eyes. Um, people are putting that one past people all the time. Um, moving through this a little bit quicker, here is, uh, what I mentioned there about the, uh, the standard for download, that's that first bullet point. Um, Wanted to mention also that some ammunitions on the current NIJ standard are are missing. We would like to see a little more ammunition on there uh, because they are becoming more and more common, such as the M855 SS109 or the green tip round uh, that is being added to the new 07 standard that is supposed to drop this fourth quarter of this year. We'll see. Um, before I move to the next slide, I do looks like we're about. Uh, eight minute warning here, so I'll be zipping through these last slides relatively quickly. Um, when you look at body armor and they are claiming NIJ compliance, please do a favor and ask either third party ballistics lab report. Ask to actually get the lab report for that exact model that you're looking at. If a company balks at giving you the, the actual lab report for that model, to make sure it's dated properly, look at what ammunitions it was hit with, and it was done with an accredited laboratory. If they deny that access, they are definitely hiding something. It means that they did some backyard testing and they think that it will stop the bullets according to what they saw. But the NIJ process for compliance is very robust. It's conditioned. It's everything from temperature to impact before striking and a whole lot of other variables. So the NIJ compliance list is a very strong indicator of quality, and you should look for evidence that, that they have the actual compliance and evidence from the third-party ballistic labs. Uh, one last point on NIJ is the word certified. It's a real hot topic. Uh, you'll, you'll ask all, you know, you should ask all the time, uh, is the rifle plate certified with the NIJ? National Institute of Justice does not have a certification program. They do have a list that your armor or a body armor's company armor will be listed on. So it's called the CPL list. 
And when people say the word certified, they actually mean, is it listed on the NIJ's compliant products list? And here is a link and a uh, website where you can actually look with your own eyes if that product and that specific model is listed. So if you hear a manufacturer saying we have NIJ certified plates, that's a little bit of a yellow flag. Uh, there is no such thing as a certification program with the NIJ. It's either you're on the compliant product list or you're not. This word certified is not accurate. So just kind of keep that in your back pocket as you're talking to armor companies. Last slide, and this is about particular sneaky claims. Uh, watch out for weight claims that are unusually low uh, for sizes. Sometimes they will list the shooter's cut, which is usually a little lower in weight under the picture of a sappy cut plate and so it makes them look like they they weigh less and then when you get the plate you're you know you're a little dis disappointed um warranty is another big one uh some companies will put very interesting wording in their warranty statements make sure that that thing's truly covered for the 5 10 or 15 years and what it means to keep the warranty in place a lot of them will require x-rays and, and mris as i mentioned uh, Good information. Uh, Appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then last thing is be very careful with timing, um, especially in polyethylene. There are some companies who make other polyethylenes, and military is migrating to polyethylene usage for a lot of armor solutions, and the Department of Defense takes precedence over, uh, over the departments and agencies in law enforcement. So we are finding ridiculously long wait times for other armor producers for polyethylene plates. A lot of out-of-stock markings. Uh, Shot Stop, we actually produce our own polyethylene, our own duridium polyethylene, so we don't deal with those problems. So make sure to get a real clear idea of the timing on delivery of, of uh, the newer generation of plates. Okay, with that, I've, I'm wrapping it up. Uh, Here's some contact information. We want to be the truth finder. We don't care if you go a shot stop or not. Of course, we'd prefer it, but we want you to find the truth and buy the right product for your specific need, as Skip highlights. And with that, uh, Aaron, I'll, I'll open it up to questions, I suppose. Absolutely, Jason. Thank you so much. And to our other panelists, uh, great job today. We have received a number of questions already, but uh, if you would like to ask a question from one of our panelists, Please just type it into the GoToWebinar toolbar and we'll get through as many as we possibly can. While we're waiting for our additional questions to come in, I did want to let folks know that our next law enforcement webinar is actually scheduled for tomorrow when we'll look at women in law enforcement, physical fitness standards. And with that, Jason, uh, are you and the other panelists ready? We are ready. If I may mention one more thing, we will be at the NSA conference in Louisville uh, booth 452, feel free to stop by in two weeks, in two weeks. Feel free to stop by and, and actually feel the Doridium plates for your own, for yourself. Get an idea of what the most advanced body armor these days looks like, and feels like, and we'll have carriers you can even try it on. Perfect. All right, our first question comes in from Howard. Howard says, I just ordered level four ceramic plates. I'm a volunteer with the local sheriff's office and go on, go on ride alongs several times per month considering the fragile nature of ceramics, but considering I'm not going to be putting the plates through hard use like a full-time officer, should I perhaps look at changing my order to the stronger composite? I, uh, I will... I'll, I'll speak to that, yeah, go if you don't mind. This is Steve Laborczyk from Ottawa County, and uh, I guess having worn steel, ceramic, and composite plates now, um, there is no comparison. And you have to look at, are you going, uh, Howard, are you going to wear them or are you going to put them in the trunk where they're not going to protect you in any way, thinking that you're actually going to have time to put the carrier on before arriving at a call? You've got to go with what you're going to wear. And that's what we, uh, law enforcement executives across this country have found. You, it has to be wearable. Otherwise, the people will not wear them. So knowing what it's wearable, but also the, Ability, the stopping power of composite. If if I were you, I'd be changing my order. Change it, Sheriff Louderback. Don't waste money. 
I mean, go go with the best you with the best you can get. Great, guys. Thank you so much. Um, Sheriffs, the next question I think is primarily directed to you. In situations where our agency is not able to afford polyethylene plates, should we allow officers to procure the body armor, the higher grade body armor, on their own, or do you see issues with that? Go ahead, Steve. I, uh, you know, having people purchase their own is, I, I think that's a gamble because you don't know what quality they're getting and you're, you're setting people up for failure. Um, there are many grants out there. There's, there's the Bulletproof Plus Partnership in Ohio. I know the Attorney General has assisted with grants for uh, body armor also, and I'm sure that's that way across many states. Um, in law enforcement, Again, from a supervisory position, there's not a lot that's better than having consistency and uh, making sure that all of your people are taken care of. Um, I do I do get small budgets. I understand that. But I think that, uh, that having the exact same equipment and knowing that it's it's good, solid equipment for your people is, is a must. That's necessary. Let me, add, let me add to what Sheriff Vorchik said. Look, this is pervasive in our industry and law enforcement. Uh, simply from lack of funding issue. I mean, this is this is one of the small monsters, or one of the largest monsters, I guess, in our basement. But once you, we, we see this with firearms all the time, where where agencies will allow um, a person to go to a gun shop and buy any firearm, and as long as they can show confidence with it, they can. And and we've had the resulting problems for that. You're going to run into the same issues. Uh, and, and really, it boils down to the to the agency administration, whether it's the city council or commissioner's court, or someone that's making the, the decision uh, of fiduciary matter in a law enforcement situation, which is flat out wrong. And so, uh, you know, I've been against that from, from day one. Been very vocal about the fact that look, um, and that, that, that this is this is where he is. I, I think an administrator has to fight that. Uh, as one of his major battles is, look, we're, we're, we have a responsibility to protect our staff and our men and women in this business, and that's what we're going to do. And just and you have to fight those battles sometimes, unfortunately. Great. Thanks, and, Sheriff. So this next question is actually for me. Jason, do you know offhand, does ShopStop help agencies write those grants or, or help them research what's available? We have helped several agencies. Skip, I'll let you uh, talk more on that. Skip yes. may have dropped. Um, oh, there he is. Sorry, Skip. No, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm here. Um, yes. If if anybody is interested, give me a call. I have some resources that could potentially help. On the state grants, I'm a little bit better on, but on the uh, national grants, I do have people that I can turn to. And actually, Colonel Johnson is has a team that is very, very good at this. So uh, you can actually contact me, and I can get you in contact with them, and we can start working step by step and helping you out. And um, can and lastly, I want to answer one thing. Going back to Howard, Howard, I'm going to ask you one question: What's your threat level, and how long are you going to wear it? What I would recommend is keeping it in a plastic. If you have those, if you have them, if you haven't, you're in great shape. But really, look at what you're going to be carrying, the weight. And uh, if you're an auxiliary, what do you do full time? And just realize I'm a, I got a bad back myself. It's not fun. <laughs> so carrying extra weight is not fun. Okay. Great, thanks, Rick. Uh, our next it, next Fred has a comment, but I'd love you all to weigh in on his comment. And what Fred said is another concern is the issue with rifle plates that are ICW plates, which stands for in conjunction with. And fun unfortunately, some officers get that ICW plates mistakenly and mistakenly have used them as a standalone plate. And he recommends extreme caution with these ICW plates. Would love to know your thoughts on that. Yes, this is this is Jason. I would love to comment on that. Thank you very much for that comment. This is a very dangerous area. I was at uh, up in Michigan last week. Uh, found an agency who were, were touting this beautiful, very thin, very light plate, standalone rifle plate. I looked at the model, uh, looked at some very small fine print on the back, 
and noticed it was an IC, it was an in conjunction with plate, only meant for soft armor underneath it to stop rifle rounds. They were shocked. Uh, they had just finished the procurement. They were very proud about their research and they were duped into buying plates that are not meant to stand alone and stop rifle rounds. Um, and the other, the other comment I'll say before anyone else steps in is um, when an in conjunction with plate is purchased, even when the agency at that time understands that soft armor needs to go under it, you never know on the generations coming. Uh, we all know how, how hand downs happen. Agencies, uh, officers coming and going, replacing, retiring, fresh out of, uh, you know, fresh out of the uh, uh, training. And there, it, things start getting muddled. And, you know, the, the people who bought it usually very quickly filter through and they don't know they're in conjunction with plates. So Shot Stop has kind of steered clear of in conjunction with plates just for that reason. Now we do have in development a very interesting product that's expected out by the end of this year where the in conjunction with plates that we are designing, should it find its way away from the soft armor underneath it, it will still stop the needed rounds. So we're, but it'll, it's going to be the border of it. So it's not anticipated, you know, it's not going to be designed as a standalone, but it will uh, defeat as a standalone without the, uh, the proper back base deformation, but it will not allow the bullets to, to penetrate. So this, this is a great point. Be very careful with in conjunction with plates. They're going to be very attractive when you look at them. They're going to be affordable. They're going to be thin. They're going to be light. And everyone's going to vote for it, but it's dangerous ground. We totally agree. All right. Thank you, gentlemen. Our next question comes in from Will, and I believe Will is talking is asking this question uh, in spe uh, specifically in relation to shot stop armor. He says, "I understand testing has been done in accordance with NIJ standards, but has it also been done to mil spec standards? And has it been tested versus incendiary or tracer ammunition?" Uh, uh, on the incendiary question, I'll answer yes, it has been tested. We tested successfully on our level four and uh, our GT plate for incendiary rounds. Uh, on the Aberdeen testing, Army testing, I'd like to, uh, Colonel Johnson, if you could maybe say some words on that. Yeah, Jason. Um, of course, I'm, I'm not, I'm not completely uh, aware of how deep the testing has gone at Aberdeen. But I, I certainly could tell you that, you know, some of the harder standards are even uh, NATO standards and, um, and shot stop plates have passed numerous tests over in Europe. So um, that, that's a fact I, you know, the way army procurement works, of course, uh, I should say military procurement works is that you, you don't test, uh, until the, uh, the the contract is bid, uh, once it's bid, then then the plates are tested to a standard that the military expects them to meet at that time. So, um, whether or not it's passed any former test, that test wouldn't be applicable to any current contract that the Army or the Marines are trying to fulfill. So, uh, what I'm really trying to say is that um, I'm confident that Shot Stop could pass any of the DOD testing requirements, but we don't really know what that is until uh, Shot Stop competes against one of those contracts. Yeah, Sam, that was absolutely. If I could say one thing on that, out in the field, if you hear, hey, is this has this passed mil spec? This word mil spec gets passed around. It is meaningless. Yeah. Uh, the, there is no mil spec. It's project by project with the Department of Defense. Right. That's a good good point. Got it. Really great point. Uh, the next question, I honestly don't know if you guys are going to be able to answer it. It's more of an investigative question. Uh, Ralph is from the Caribbean, and he says that they're seeing an increase in the number of perpetrators wearing body armor, and he's wondering if there's any way to trace the procurement source for that body armor. The, uh, I'll answer for shots up on that. Our serial numbers, uh, you know, well, this assumes that the, the perp is captured. Uh, there are serial numbers which tracks back the path of each plate, so it is absolutely trackable. We are also implementing RFID technologies within our plates, uh, so it's going to only be more trackable. So it is dependent 
on the situation, but it is as trackable as possible, uh, given that the perp is captured. Great, thank you. More more of an answer than I honestly expected with that one, so thanks so much. Uh, just a couple that more questions. That is part of the NIJ standard, too, by the way. Oh, it is. Okay, so any NIJ standard plate should, have, should be able to be tracked. Okay. Perfect. Uh, our next question is from Jim. He says that given the armor stops the round, what other kind of injuries can be suffered, such as broken ribs, et cetera? Yeah, uh, this, this is a... It, there's there's back face deformation allowance. The current NIJ 010.06 standard allows for a 44 millimeter back face deformation on the first two impacts uh, for these rifle rounds. Then it has to, beyond that, stop four more rounds from penetrating. There's no back face deformation requirement on the last four rounds of the six shot NIJ compliance test. Uh, the injuries that happen from it depends where it hits on the body, obviously. Uh, the likelihood if you get hit with an M80 765, 765 by 51 or 762 by 51, you're definitely going to have some broken ribs. There's going to be some, some back face injury. Um, ballistics is a strange thing. I've heard stories of bullets hitting people's calves and exploding their heart because of the blood pressure. Um, AP round, if a standard NATO AP round hits, on the front of a body, the entire back can be black and blue of that person from head to foot. Uh, so it does very strange things, that kinetic energy dispersing through the body. Uh, it, it depends on the round, depends on the angle that that round hits. Uh, many, 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 many things can happen, including death, even if the plate performs perfectly. So uh, we really can't answer what other injuries. It's, it's bizarre what happens with ballistics because it's such high mass. But um, just know that injuries do happen when you get struck by rifle rounds, especially. Um, but it, it does mitigate the risk of death significantly, obviously. So hope that helps to understand a little bit. It didn't answer you specifically, but it's the best we can do. Jason, this is Skip. I want to I want to add one comment to that. Let's just imagine taking a piece of steel, a steel plate, and taking a hammer and putting this on somebody's torso, and I smash them in their chest with a hammer. What happens to the energy? Let's do the same thing with a ceramic plate, and let's do the same thing with a, a polyethylene plate. And think about what happens with that kinetic energy and what would it do. It just depends. But it's just a thought I want to put you in the head where, put in your head what would happen. So it's sort of simulating that kind of. Yeah, that's good. Jairus or uh, the colonel. Great. Thank you, gentlemen. Last question for today comes from uh, from David. Do your level three and four plates recommend or require a small liner, or is it not needed? Uh, that's a great question. It is not needed. This is one of our, our wonderful value points is that our uh, polyethylene catches rounds at up to 120 degree angles. So if that is, if, you know, especially with steel, the closer to, the further away from 90 degree or a perpendicular impact you get, the, the more dangerous the ricochet and spalling. If you look at any YouTube video and you see how our polyethylene pleats actually just capture the round and encapsulates it, flattens it, and holds it. The spalling is almost a non-threat until you get to the very edge perimeters, which just can't be helped if you nick it on with you know, a half inch on the edge, sometimes some spalling or, or the bullet can spray sideways, but that's the case with all body armor. But good question, and it is definitely addressed in the shot stop duridium uh, polyethylene plates. It captures spalling and the bullet. Ricochet is minimized uh, dramatically compared to any other technology. Got it. Great. Uh, again, gentlemen, thank you so much for spending the time with us today. Before we close out, I would actually like to see Jason, Rick, any final closing comments from either or both of you? Thank you. Just thank you for your service out there. Be safe. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. And with that, this concludes today's Justice Clearinghouse webinar. Please be safe, everyone. Bye now. Thank you very much. Thank you.